What's up guys? This is Pierce. This is Tales from the Road. Thanks so much for stopping by. We're sitting here on the seaside of Kadikoy in central Istanbul on the Asian side. But as you saw from the uh, headline of today's video, we will not in fact be discussing anything about Turkey. Um, for many of you that have been watching my videos, you may know or you may not know that I lived in Vietnam for just over 11 months, almost one year. And as a political science major, someone that loves studying politics, it was very interesting and refreshing living in a place that deems themselves as a communist slash socialist country. We have a lot of things that we think about when we hear the word communism and the word socialism, especially as an American. And today I'd like to unpack those for you to give you my real subjective experiences of what I experienced, what I lived, uh, what I lived through, what I saw, what I heard, and everything in between. So if that sounds interesting, come along. In the political climate of our current world, people tend to do a lot of talking. There's a lot of focus on the isms, right? Communism, capitalism, fascism. People throw around these ideologies, you know. Um, they use these as talking points. They, they have strong opinions on these things, but uh, especially as a political science major, it really takes a lot more nuance and a lot more reflection to really understand and unpack what these things truly are and what they truly mean. Many people demonize communism, many people demonize capitalism, but until you've lived and experienced and talked to the people and really seen how it is on the ground, sometimes it's really hard to even get a small grasp of what's actually happening. In political science, we read the, Com uh, the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx. Um, we read some other communist thinkers. We read speeches from Lenin. We've read speeches from Stalin. And the thing is that Communism has so many more nuances than um, just, I think, what you get from the books. And the way that we teach it in America, oftentimes we focus on the major negatives, right? We talk about it in the context of the USSR, of the Maoist struggle in China, of the Vietnam War, the domino theory effect. And all of these things leaves us with a really negative impression, right? McCarthyism, right? This idea that commu the communist scourge is going to come to America and wipe out all the values and all the things that we worked hard to understand, to mate, to create, to do. And in many ways those were fair. The thing is, after a while living in communism, you really understand, at least a little bit on the surface from what you can get as an expat, what's going on, um, especially if you're working. What's, what's actually happening? What, what political mechanisms are at play and what things are actually happening on the ground? Today in the context of Vietnamese communism or Vietnamese socialism, I'm really going to unpack the things that I saw as a expat living in Vietnam. What I can really say I felt, um, how communism there affected me personally, and how it changed or shaped my overall understanding of the country, the culture, its past, and its future. So let's unpack some of these right now. The first thing I really want to talk about is the cult of personality and the ideology-based communism that you see in Vietnam. For many of you that don't know about the cult of personality, this is a selling point that many people have used to, regardless of, of ideological background. It's essentially taking one figure, one kind of non-polarizing or maybe, let's say, historically significant figure, and using them to basically create your cause, to be the symbol of a cause, to have a person that everyone can look up to, everyone can know, um, to know exactly what they're standing for and using their symbology to impact a society. So in Vietnam, this man is Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh was essentially the communist revolutionary leader of the North Vietnamese during the struggle, especially against the French and in, the late, in his later years against the Americans. V uh, Ho Chi Minh himself, uh, while he was a, was a, a communist, he actually learned uh, from school in Moscow. He actually lived in Paris as well. He knew that through this ideology, through getting the working class, not even the working class in this case, the subjugated Vietnamese class on board uh, with all of the same ideologies, you know, taking away what really people want. He knew that he could use Vietnamese nationalism in a sense to make sure that the Vietnamese could recapture their country from the colonials and make sure that they can hold their country from the, uh, the American invasion. 
Many people say the Vietnamese communism that came out of that today is much more influenced by Le Zuan, who was the uh, communist general, the number two man in charge, who really built the modern state of Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh died in 1969. Um, obviously, the Vietnam War didn't end until 1975. So some of the more hardline communist principles that are credited to Ho Chi Minh, some people would argue that's actually not true. Ho Chi Minh really became a figurehead for the movement, especially upon his death in 1969. He became this kind of, this figure, this leader. You know, like when you think of Russia, you think of Stalin, you think of Lenin. And in the, in the former Soviet Union, they put their faces on everything so that you had like a, a figurehead for the entire ideology. The Vietnamese did that in the 1960s and the 1970s, and they continue to do it today. You walk throughout Vietnam and the communist symbology is very, very real. You see the hammer and sickle flag almost everywhere you go. Anytime you see a Vietnamese flag, right next to it will be a communist flag. And the party itself is very proud of this. Um, and it's a sign of, it's, it's a very complicated thing to unpack, but it's basically, you know, it, this is our nationalism and our nationalism is intertwined within communism. And this is who we are and this is the country that we are in. Does everybody agree with it in Vietnam? Absolutely not. Is some of it a power play um, on the southern Vietnamese? Totally could be, but that's the reality on the ground. You walk around, there's uh, Vietnamese style propaganda, um, kind of these ways of controlling people, of telling people information, of making sure that people are fo uh, following party guidelines everywhere you go. And you see the hammer and sickle pretty much on everything. If it's sponsored by the government, you got the hammer and sickle. So if you're talking about ideology mixed with symbology. Vietnam is a really good country to kind of understand where these two things come together and how these can maybe have a longer term impact on people's thinking in the future. On the expat, the outcome of this is pretty nominal. I think for some of us that have never really seen communism, especially or lived near a country that is communist, just like we have in the United States, like you would very rarely see a hammer and sickle like anywhere. Um, going to Vietnam can be a bit like, whoa, that's really crazy. I can't believe this exists. But um, the symbols uh, and the effect, especially on tourism and people who just come in and leave or expats who are living there, you don't really feel it. Um, as an expat, I didn't feel it at all. The only time I felt any sort of communist influence is when I was working. I used to work for an NGO, a very large international NGO. And there you have to deal with the Communist Party. But, you know, for the, for, I guess, for the, the average foreigner, uh, your experience within the communism symbology stop, starts and stops there. You know, when you go to a museum, uh, they're going to have a twinge of pro-communism. When you go to uh, various places, you're going to see the hammer and sickle. And it's just something that you get used to. It's like when you go to any country and you see their flag. Um, some countries have more flags than others. Here in Turkey, they, they put the Turkish flag all over the place. Nationalism is important in the world we live in. And uh, that's kind of... I think the start and stop. Now, where it goes for the Vietnamese people, um, there's much more complicated political and ideological debates on how this symbology really affects society. Um, I might not be the best one to unpack that for you, so if you're interested, I'll find some more videos and I can link them below. Now let's get into some of the life living under communism, but also just living under another country with, uh, with many different things. So, first things first, Vietnam is a one-party state. What does that mean? In Vietnam, you can't really vote. There's only one party. It's the Communist Party of Vietnam. The central party controls basically everything that has to do with government, from the very little guy in your neighborhood who uh, makes sure your housing is registered to the uh, highest official, the, the prime minister, who basically operates the entire economy, the entire social structure in Hanoi. The Vietnamese Communist Party seems to really be in charge of a lot of different things and so I want to unpack some of these uh, quickly for you. So one thing uh, that I want to start out with is corruption. This uh, is not a thing that is only seen in communism. Of course there's corruption all over the world but uh, living in Vietnam uh, you do see this like lower level of corruption and you do experience it. So um, living in the United States you know we talk a lot about police violence these days and all these different things. Um, when we're talking about the corruption of the police themselves, uh, in the United States, I could not imagine getting pulled over by a police officer and uh, him basically asking me for money to let me go. Now, of course, this can happen in the United States, but typically $10 uh, certainly wouldn't be the number to, uh, <laughs> to get him to leave me alone. And the, even the thought of bribing a police officer 
uh, I couldn't even really imagine what that would look like or how that would go. In Vietnam, however, they have this idea of coffee money. So uh, there's a pretty big racial profiling issue in Vietnam. So if a cop sees you and you know you're like, uh, you don't look Asian, um, the chance of you getting pulled over is pretty high. Um, when you do get pulled over, however, it may be for a traffic violation. It may actually just be for nothing. Um, you're gonna probably have to bribe the police. So. Uh, they don't even look at your registration. They don't ask you anything. Sometimes they make up something that you were doing and then they ask you for eight bucks, 10 bucks, 15 bucks, and they let you go on, the, on your way. A quick anecdote I have is I was driving, I was making a left turn, they pulled me over, they said I was in the wrong lane even though I was making a left turn. They didn't ask me for my registration, didn't have it. They didn't ask me for my driver's license, also didn't have one. They said, uh, give me 200,000 dong, which is the equivalent of like eight to $10. And uh, I gave them cash, goes in the pocket, and they let me go. It's this low-level corruption that I find many expats um, find is very unfair. You can see this with landlords. You can see this with basically anyone who has power and anyone who realizes that you don't speak Vietnamese, you don't know what's going on, and it's in your best interest to just pay them off. Is this right? I don't think so. Is this what happens? Absolutely. Is this linked to communism? I don't know. I don't think so. Sometimes um, in one party states, power becomes unhinged in the fact that like what is acceptable to people um, is only controlled by one voice. So if you dissent, uh, your voice isn't heard. If you say, hey, the police are corrupt or the police are um, unwilling to help, um, it could simply be that, uh, you know, they don't care about your opinion or that's how it goes and that's how it's going to continue to go. It's not to say that Vietnam doesn't have corruption at high levels, it certainly does, but many countries have corruption at high levels. So I'm just saying as the regular guy living in Vietnam, there is some low level corruption that you're gonna experience, fact. The second thing I wanna talk about is safety and crime and punishment. I will say wholeheartedly, I believe in a free society, I believe in the ideals of having strong individualism and I believe in the positives of capitalism. I will say that, that's who I am. But Vietnam is the safest place I have ever lived. Walking around in Vietnam, you very, very rarely ever feel sketched out. The majority of the people seem very friendly. Walking around at night, men or women, any time of the day, it seems pretty good. Um, the average Vietnamese person certainly experiences less violence in their life than the average American person or the average European person. Um, there's very few, actually there's no places in the city that I ever went where I felt scared, where I felt uncomfortable. And as a tourist or as a person just walking around as an expat, there's no problem. There's really no problem. And so it was so refreshing living in a place where yeah, I really do feel safe all the time and I really feel like I can be myself and I really feel like no one's going to bother me. Um, having lived in, you know, bigger cities in Europe and having grown up in New Mexico, violence is an everyday thing that we have to consider. Um, am I in the right place at the right time? Um, can I, or if someone does come up to me, what do I do? Are all strangers' uh, inter interactions going to be beneficial for me? In Vietnam, honestly, never had an issue. I never thought once that I was unsafe. And this is a really common theme that I've had talking to most of my expat friends. It's really, it's really an incredible thing. The reason for this is that each neighborhood is kind of ruled by a communist party representatives. This is the person who's in charge of taking tabs on people, understanding where people are. And if people get out of line, the communist party is informed and that person will be removed. So, Remember, in communism, in this specific case in Vietnam, if you are doing things that are deemed as you know, bad for the party, bad for society, bad for your comrades, you're demonized. You are taken to jail, you are cut out of the community, you are put into some sort of uh, situation uh, that removes you from being a normal citizen. There's a big push for being part of the norm in Vietnam, and if you don't follow it, Sometimes things can go bad for you. So you really do feel this when you see everybody just kind of being passive about things and kind of going, going with the way things go. Everyone accepts the reality that they're in, it seems, and uh, they don't want to stir the pot because stirring the pot in communism is bad. There can be very bad, bad things that happen to you. And so you can really see this. I will say it's not as repressive as China, 
Um, I've talked to many Chinese people and if you talk to them like over Skype or something, they will not tell you anything about the government because they're afraid of being watched. I've met many Vietnamese people and we'll talk politics and I even have a friend who's a big communist guy. And you know, he'll tell you, he'll tell you, um, you know, uh, his opinion and he won't hold it back. Um, obviously, maybe if you have a less favorable, favorable opinion, you want to be a little quiet about it. But, um, you know, overall, I was very surprised with the amount that uh, Vietnamese people actually got to say. Um, but I do think that in the future, it will be much more like China and uh, the repression on the people um, will come. I really do think so. Our third topic we're going to discuss is economics. So Vietnam is a booming. Their economy has gone through the roof in the last 10 years or 15 years. And walking around the beach resorts, walking around the massive infrastructural buildup of Saigon, uh, of the rich neighborhoods in Hanoi, um, you're like, well, hey, this doesn't seem particularly communist. And the answer is, it's not. Communism in Vietnam uh, really starts and stops with the control of the people, the control of the masses, and the verification of everything that happens within the civil society. So everything needs to go through the Communist Party, start and stop Communist Party. That being said, if you want to build huge buildings, you want to do trade abroad, you want to be integrated into the wild network of, uh, of today's globalism and today's global trade, um, you can do that. You have to make sure that you uh, maybe comply with party officials. There may be some bribery involved, but in general, that economy is going insane. It's very similar to China in this case where, um, you know, we say the Chinese are communist. Um, communist may be in social repression, but they're certainly not communist in actual economic, um, economic institutions. And so you can see that in Saigon, which is uh, going to be one of the new tiger economies in Asia. It's a mega city. There's lots of money coming in and out. And it's global and international. Um, many of the Vietnamese officials will set aside maybe some of these more communist, repressive, um, like let's say economic talking points um, for the betterment of their country and for the betterment of the economy in their country. Uh, Vietnam was one of the poorest nations in 1980, and now they are killing it. Um, the average wage in Vietnam has risen quite a bit. There are some poor areas, but you can really see um, the positive effects that their government's um, policies have, have had and the, the integration of the global economy that Vietnam is experiencing um, has been paramount to their growth. And so if you're talking purely economics, I wouldn't say it's particularly that communist. So when we do talk about economics, we do talk about state-run corporations, state-run businesses, and there is one company to uh, basically to talk about, which is the Vincorp. Uh, Vincorp is owned by uh, some big wigs of the Vietnam Vietnamese high society, as well as uh, a bit of the state as well. Um, it's kind of hard to see where the state stops and where the, where the private ownership begins, but they are doing all these different things. They own supermarket chains, they own movie theaters and malls, they, uh, they just started a company called VinFast which does cars, um, and they're actually uh, setting up a manufacturing facility in Australia. So um, this is a company with the kind of principles of being a one-party state-owned company, but with the globalist I ideology of any capitalist corporation. So it's really interesting to see how these kind of two really polarizing opposites can actually work in harmony when it comes to uh, economic uh, modernity and economic globalism. It's very, very interesting. Next up, we're gonna talk about globalism and the press. So um, in many communist places, uh, we know that VPNs are essential. These are the um, IP address blockers or IP address transfer websites that allow us to freely browse the internet. So in Vietnam, I had a VPN. Uh, the government has complete authority to look at what you're looking at, to take data on you, to do these things um, that uh, in my heart of hearts I think are wrong um, and I think that are bad for people. In Vietnam, in Vietnam they do them. So that is what it is. Um, is the press free? No, the press is not free. Uh, there's lots of um, things that are written um, by various sources that have to be essentially checked by the Communist Party to make sure that they're okay. Um, journalists get arrested. And you can't access BBC, you can't access some American news sites. So um, I think the stranglehold on information in Vietnam, it's not as bad as China. It's certainly not as bad as other places, but it still exists. Um, I find that in this case, um, I did experience that as I, I became more concerned about my own browsing preferences, my own 
things that I was looking up uh, and, you know, just what I was reading, you know. I, I don't like any government to take data on what I do without my consent. And so if you do live in Vietnam and you don't have a VPN, I would consider getting one. If you do want to travel to uh, these uh, Laos, Vietnam, China, if you want to do these, uh, go to these places, you have to be aware that everything you do, everything you say uh, is being recorded, um, whether you want it to be or not. And, you know, in the U.S. you could say, yeah, that's kind of true as well. Um, but what they can do with that data, um, there's no infringement on your civil rights. And I think that's kind of the, the issue. So um, that's one thing to look at. And then the second part is, is globalism. How does Vietnam function as a communist country in this global society where people have free speech and where uh, the youth are on their phones and looking at Instagram and media from different places? And what I can say is that the youth are very, um, I don't want to say docile is the, is the right word, but many of them seem kind of like this is the way it is and everything's going okay it's much better than it was during my parents generation so there's not really much to complain about i kind of get that feeling um is that a good thing um i'm not sure uh is the life in vietnam better than it was the last generation was it better than it was 10 15 years ago absolutely so um i think until the day where the vietnamese realize man this uh government is repressive and they're not respecting the vietnamese people um, I think something will change. Until then, um, it really feels like the Vietnamese government does care and work for the Vietnamese people. Um, I will say the COVID situation, the Vietnamese crushed it. They had like less than a thousand cases over six months and we basically had no quarantine and the government was really responsive, really hardline and knew exactly what they wanted to do strategy wise, which I can say, you know, is better than most countries that I've seen in the world. And honestly, Vietnam with a hundred million people it's probably the best country in the world for a coronavirus response. So um, how can this happen from a repressive communist regime? Um, I think number one is that, you know, uh, no one can question uh, the authority of the party. So the party had a plan uh, when they figured out something was wrong. Uh, they had no issues with closing the border with China. They had no issues with closing the border with um, Europe. Uh, they had no issue with shutting down shops. Their main goal was to protect the Vietnamese people, and I commend them for that. It was a great policy, and I felt it made everyone feel safe, and uh, you can still feel the repercussions of those, uh, of those choices in a, neg in, a, in a positive way. It's really, the, what they achieved uh, is great. Now, do I think that uh, everybody should have a voice and everybody's opinion should be heard? Yes, but in this case, uh, we see that authoritarian regimes have had much better results with preventing coronavirus and making sure their citizens stay healthy and aren't dying and having safe borders and all of these things, uh, you know, I can really get down with. I can really get down with for sure. It was very, very interesting living there during the coronavirus time. Uh, there are, of course, negatives with that. So if they purported that you may have had coronavirus, they would just throw you in a quarantine camp or throw you in some type of prison. If you didn't, uh, if you, didn't uh, you know, follow the rules and regulations, uh, they could easily throw you in prison. So, uh, you know, it's weird because in the U.S. it's like we do whatever we want. And I think there's really good parts of that, but I think there's really negative parts. So uh, in Vietnam, you know, if I'm not going to follow the rules, I'm going to go to jail. That's just what's going to happen. So I think people have that mindset. And when they said we're locking down the country, sorry, that's what happened. And now I think the Vietnamese people are trying to figure out, like, what's next? How do we come out of that situation? How do we reopen our country? How do we get our economy rolling forward? And I really do wholeheartedly believe that the government is behind the people in a very positive way in this sense. And they're trying to work to get their country on board, but in a safe and secure manner. The last thing I want to talk about is freedom. Are the Vietnamese people free? Did I feel free when I was in Vietnam? I can say as an expat, I felt the freest that I have ever felt anywhere in the world at this point. The reason for that is that if you're an expat, you kind of feel like the rules just don't apply to you. And of course, like, you don't kill someone, you know, don't steal stuff, but because you don't know what's going on and because you can bribe the police and because uh, they, people see you as other, you can really get away with a lot of stuff that in other countries just wouldn't fly. So um, what does that mean for the Vietnamese people? I feel like the Vietnamese people, are they free? I don't know. I don't know. Some of them seem, they seem happy. They definitely seem happy. People seem to be living better lives than they did in the past. Um, my friends who are pro-communist said, you know, things are going great. My friends who are not pro-communist said, um, you know, they wish they had certain things, but, you know, they can travel. Um, they're getting more money. Uh, they can do different things. They can do what they want to do. Uh, it's quite uh, equal for men and women in Vietnam these days. And 
it's really hard to report. Are they free? What does it really mean? I'm not even sure um, at this point. All right, guys, we just unpacked a lot of topics. I know it was long, but uh, if you made it to this point, uh, thank you so much for watching the video. Uh, definitely make sure to like and subscribe. Uh, I want to keep doing these political topics, and I want to finish with this point. Um, I lived in Vietnam for 11 months under communism. What did I learn? I learned that there's so much more nuance to the world and to politics than people give it credit for. I think we get so lost in the ideologies these days, the isms, and I think that the people on the ground living in these places are just trying to get by. We're all the same people. We're all trying to live better lives. We're trying to support our families. We're trying to, you know, eat, go to the movies, have fun. And I think no matter what ism you're living under, there's going to be positives and there's going to be negatives. And so I will say um, Vietnam is a spectacular place. And it's a place where you can really learn a lot about yourself, where you can really learn a lot about others, where you can kind of like take yourself out of what you know and really just try to adjust to something completely different. And I think that's so important for people these days because maybe we would be less stuck debating the isms and hating each other for these things if we just tried to understand the other side. So I'll leave you guys with that. I hope you guys have a great day. We're enjoying this seaside. It's beautiful here. And uh, stay tuned for the next video. Have a good one.